This video is brought to you by Ground News. Back in 2019, Boris Johnson made two promises that famously carried him to number 10, Brexit and levelling up. Levelling up was Johnson's signature policy to solve regional inequality in the UK, and he often spoke of unleashing the potential of Britain's poorer areas. But now, five years on, a new report from the Institute for Public Policy Research shows that the UK's regional inequality is actually set to get even worse over the next decade. So in this video, we'll take a look at Britain's regional inequality, why it's getting worse and whether it can change. So let's start by looking at some context. The first thing to say is that regional inequality in the UK isn't an entirely new thing, and it first started to become apparent from around 1979. This graph from the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows how the 1980s saw a widening gap in income inequality between the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile of the distribution. In the same period, the share of income belonging to the richest 1% increased from just under 4% to around 6%. Then, through the 1990s and 2000s, income inequality generally stabilised across most of the distribution, while the richest 1% got even richer still. Now, this has made the UK one of the most economically unequal countries in the OECD. But what's most interesting is that when you look at income inequality on a map of the UK, it becomes immediately clear that it's predominantly a regional issue. London and the South are far wealthier than parts of the Midlands, Wales and the North which explains why Boris Johnson focused his campaigning for the 2019 election in those worse off parts of the country. But despite all the rhetoric, if we fast forward to 2024, it doesn't look like much has improved. Recent analysis by The Guardian newspaper suggests that the government has failed to make progress on six out of the 12 levelling up targets it set out in 2022, with three of them, local pride, housing and health, actually deteriorating in the last two years. Moreover, the IPPR's latest report shows that regional gaps in wealth, opportunity and even life expectancy are only expected to grow over the next decade, with London and the South pulling further ahead and the North and Midlands being left behind. So now let's have a look at how regional inequality is set to worsen by 2030. The wealth gap between the North and Midlands and the rest of England is widening and in the poorest region, the North East, the median level of wealth today is even lower than it was back in 2006 in real terms. Now, this really doesn't bode well for the long term because of the UK's taxation system. Economists have pointed out that the current systems of inheritance tax and capital gains tax disproportionately benefit those in London and the South. To explain this briefly, capital gains tax is a tax on profit from the sale of assets, including property and shares. The richest 1% of the UK population, especially the top 0.1%, are more likely to earn their income from capital, i.e. business ownership, than through employment, which is taxed at a much higher rate. So if you're among the top 1% of business owners, you can access a tax rate of just 27%. But if you're in the top 1% of wage earners, you can get taxed on up to 49% of your income. Now, this is a significant factor when it comes to regional inequality, as capital gains are heavily concentrated in London and the South East. Research published in February found that a single neighbourhood of 6,400 people in Kensington, one of London's richest boroughs, had as much in capital gains as all of Liverpool, Manchester and Newcastle combined. And Kensington's overall share of UK capital gains was more than the entirety of Wales. On a different note too, life expectancy is also on track to rise more rapidly in London over the next decade than anywhere else, while it's actually set to decline in the northeast, the Midlands, the east of England and the southwest. Some parts of the north, like the northwest and Yorkshire, should see a steady improvement, but in 2030, people in the north and Midlands will still die on average two and a half years earlier than those in the south, or three and a half years before those in London. Mortality rates in some parts of the north, like Blackpool, Manchester or Hull, are actually comparable to those in Turkey, partly because lower economic activity is linked to worse health, but also due to poor local governance and problems with local authority funding. If things continue on their current trajectory, it will take more than 50 years to close the gap in healthy life expectancy between the north and the southeast, while the gap between the north and London will continue to grow further. So after that colossal information dump, can anything actually be done to solve regional inequality in the UK? Well, as we've already mentioned, Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda hasn't made much of a difference at all in its first five years. 
This doesn't just matter practically, but also politically, as the public perception of inequality and the failure of levelling up leads to a loss of trust in the government. One way this could be restored is through greater devolution, or even just by strengthening relationships between local and regional authorities. In 2020, the government also suggested that the House of Lords could be moved to York or even Stoke-on-Trent, which, despite causing a lot of debate, probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. Another issue, though, is that it's actually just really difficult to undo the decades-long economic gap between London and the South East and the rest of the UK. Young people are increasingly moving to London for better jobs and higher salaries, and then moving out to the surrounding areas as they become wealthier. Businesses also see better investment and growth opportunities in the capital. The UK's leading financial sector is in London, which contributes approximately 12% of annual GDP and 2.5 million jobs to the national economy. And while Manchester has the biggest financial services industry outside of London and a rapidly growing fintech sector, London's economy is still projected to grow more rapidly over the next two years than Manchester's. Meanwhile, other northern cities like Leeds, which has huge growth potential but lower than average productivity, are held back by poor transport systems. And in a recent blow, the government's cancellation of the northern section of HS2, a high-speed rail line, went down like a lead balloon among voters who were promised better infrastructure. Ultimately, levelling up still has a long way to go. Politically, we're already starting to see that voters in disaffected constituencies are choosing to elect non-conformist, radical politicians like George Galloway and Rochdale. There's also a strong economic argument for solving regional inequality, which is that it improves a country's overall growth. A change of government at the next general election might create new optimism, but in practice, the efficient planning and execution of levelling up projects will be a huge test for a possible Labour government. When researching regional differences in the UK, we found that it was really important to balance the different opinions on this topic. Fortunately, we were able to easily compare opinions thanks to our sponsor Ground News, a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organisations. For example, take this story about William Ragg. Right away, you can see that the story had 12 outlets reporting on it. And of these 12, 67% lean left, while only 8% lean right. Every story also comes with a detailed view of the bias distribution, factuality scores, and even specific ownership information. You can also swipe through some of the headlines to get a more detailed understanding of how reporting might change based on political bias. I also especially like their blind spot feed, which shows you stories underreported by either side of the political spectrum. Ground News is such a useful tool for our current media landscape, and I cannot recommend it enough. I've become much better at spotting political bias, and I've surprisingly challenged some of my own views. In fact, if you subscribe today, you'll get 40% off their Vantage plan. That's $5 a month for unlimited access to every incredible Ground News feature. This offer is only available here, so make sure you go to ground.news slash TLDR or click the link in the description below to get started and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.